all the other things that's on this list for how I want to be treated was don't minimize and don't discount what I'm going through. Another thing we do is, oh, I've been through that. Oh my goodness, well, let me tell you what I did and what happened to me. You know, you, the minute you start to share, then somebody wants to bring up their life story and tell, and at that point, you don't want to hear it, do you? Mm -hmm. And I have to watch myself on that too. I know, it's like you start opening my mouth and going, shut it, Liz, because right now you need to listen. And not jump in with, oh, when I went through the same thing, and you're going, I don't want to hear what you went through right now. I'm in my own pain. I just want you to listen to me. This is my pain, not your pain. Good for you, you got through it, but right now, I'm hurting. Please listen to me and walk through me in the, with me in the pain. Don't minimize what I'm going through just because you've had the joy of coming out of it. Just minister to me and give me what you received that helped you. Don't allow me to take a victim role. The reason that we have too many people walking around with their wings unfurled is because they were feeling like victims and Jesus has delivered us to victory. But if I walk around feeling like I'm the victim of a crime, whether it's through abuse or rejection or betrayal, and all of us have gone through some level of that in the way we live in this present world, if I keep that on my back, I'm never going to get off the ground. I have to release it. It comes back to what's my identity? Who am I? In Christ, I'm a victorious woman of God who is the daughter of the King. I don't have to be a victim. Challenge me to forgive as Christ forgives others. Bottom line on inner healing is, usually it leads, it's a path that leads to unforgiveness at some level. The root will come down to some level of unforgiveness. Even if it's an affirmation issue, that can be like this level, but underneath this, there's this unforgiveness of somebody who has not affirmed me, maybe a parent, maybe a spouse, a workplace, and underneath that causes resentment to the person who either left you or broke you or spoke wrong words to you. One of the most significant verses in the Bible on healing is in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6. It follows the Lord's Prayer, verse 14, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. Verse 15, But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. That is a verse that when you share with people, when I first read it, I was like, wow, I don't care read that. You read the Lord, Lord's Prayer and then stop. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. So does that mean I've lost my salvation? Now I know those of you who have been through the teaching of forgiveness that have done, you know that's not what it means. But you have to look at the parable of the wicked servant in Matthew 18 who, remember, he was forgiven much, like six million dollars of debt. And then he goes down and he punishes a servant, a lower servant, for ten dollars of debt. And the king comes along and he says, you wicked person, you've been forgiven so much and you couldn't forgive your servant ten dollars? You will be in torment, you'll be put in prison in torment. And I believe that when we look at that, what it's saying is that I, if I'm not forgiving another person, I'm going to live in torment. It's like I'm Paul said to hand the sinning brother over to Satan to be corrected. That's a strong term. But that's basically what's going to happen is if I'm holding on to forgiveness, I cannot have fellowship with God because it's a sin. And God can't look on sin. Do I lose my salvation? I don't believe so. Unless I've offended the Holy Spirit and I'm completely you know, denying the work of God in my life. But if I'm a believer and I'm saying, yeah, I believe in Jesus, I'm going to, but this guy over here, I'll never forgive him. I can't. What's that going to happen? What's going to happen? It blocks the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. You no longer can be a vessel. There's a blockage. There's a flow through because the Spirit will be quenched, grieved, offended by sin in my life. 
And that's why for me, if I'm ministering to others, I have to be quick. I have to keep short accounts of what's going on in my life because we can't get up and stand and speak to others when there's something going to block because all I'll be speaking out of is my own flesh. The Spirit can't move through because I can't hear Him anymore. I'm going to be deaf to the Holy Spirit. So forgiveness is key to inner healing. I want to read some scriptures and then I'm going to invite Geneva to come up. Um, and just share some of the struggles that she's had um, and some of the victories she's had in the inner healing lesson. But let's look at some scripture. Turn to um, Jeremiah 31, 25. Jeremiah, I think somebody read it yesterday. It's in our first, it's in our flip chart. It's a wonderful verse. These are some verses to keep in your toolkit to be able to pull out to minister to somebody who's broken hearted, and they are in your flashcards. But in the King, New King James verse, I, I love the translation, it says, I have satiated the weary soul, and I have replenished every sorrowful soul. I have satiated the weary soul. Do Christians get weary? Yes, do we get sorrowful? Yes. So what we're talking about when we say inner healing, it's not a funky new age word. It's ministering to your inner, inner emotions. It's ministering to the part of you that is struggling under something that's been done to you or something you've done or a circumstance. And I can take that to the Lord and know that his promise is he has filled the weary soul and replenished every sorrowful soul. This is part of coming out of that same message of come to heal the, heal the broken hearted. Turn to Psalm uh, 147. Psalm 147. He heals the brokenhearted, verse 3, and he binds up their wounds. He heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. <coughs> you know, when we're not going through a time of sorrow in our hearts, um, we can read through these verses very glibly, can't we? You know, he heals the broken heart and he binds up the wounds. But when your heart is broken, you get a hold of that and you're going, your word says that you heal the broken hearted and I'm going to cling to that. I'm going to believe you, Lord. You bind up my wounds. You just think of that until the wound is healed because the wounds don't heal immediately. So they have to be bound. So it's like Jesus puts a protection over them. He wraps them up. And we can wrap the wounds up for another believer that's hurting around enemy by saying, you know, I'm going to cover them with the love of God. I'm going to, I'm going to cover them with prayer. I'm, I'm going to cover them with love. I'm going to cover them with gentleness and, and compassion until you are healed. We become ministers of healing when we can be someone who can go and help be Jesus to somebody by binding their wounds up for them until the Lord finishes his work of healing their heart. When I was doing, uh, and I want to share this as an example of how you do inner healing. When I was first involved in um, going to India, at the very beginning, there was a gentleman who came to stay with me. His name was Ray Eicher. It was a miraculous meeting. He'd been the director of ministry in India, Operation Mobilization, the largest ministry in India. And he'd left that ministry after 17 years to, uh, to work for LL, which is a, a ministry based in the UK, which deals in inner healing and deliverance. And somebody connected to me and he came and stayed in my house. And, and I have to say that I was like, you know, inner healing, deliverance. I didn't come out of that church background. It's a bit weird. You know, I hope there's nothing too spooky about this. But it was the greatest lesson. And it's God gave me that man and his tools and his teaching to help me bring to you a message of inner healing that you could share with women all over the world. And what he brought me was this, this carrot diagram. It was, and, it, and this. 
And it was so simple, and he talked about forgiveness. He sat in my front room with five or six women, and he just talked through his own story. And he'd been in ministry for 17 years as a national director, thousands of staff. And he said, Liz, men would come over from other parts of Europe for meetings to India, and we'd all gather together, and uh, we'd have our you know, leadership meetings, and we'd pat each other, how are you doing, brother? Oh, great, brother, how's it going? Oh, great, how's the ministry? Oh, it's growing, you know, we're planting churches, and we're doing, it's all the celebratory stuff, and all the success, it's all good. He said, I would go home and my life, my family's life was miserable. Miserable. He said, I had a spirit of lust and a spirit of anger and I hurt my wife and I hurt my children. But I was out there, you know, yeah, brother, everything's good. So I don't know what happened that changed his, his background, but he left and he went to, take, to receive ministry from LL up in the Lake District in the UK. And he was there for nine weeks. And... The Lord, through that time, uncovered things in his heart that had never been dealt with. He was adopted, rejected as a child in India, born to a German, a British woman, a German soldier, and, uh, and put into adoption, and never touched before he was born, and never touched after he was born, rather, for four days. So there was a, there was a bonding that never happened, a nurturing that never happened right there. And then growing up with the spirit of adoption on him, rejection by his initial parents, it had never been dealt with. Now he was a believer, he was a missionary, he was leading a ministry. But he had wounds that he didn't even know he had. And it was causing anger and lustful spirits. See, there is a, there is a demonic element involved that we don't understand. Satan is very much alive and he has power if we let him have power. We have to understand that the blood of Jesus defeats Satan's power. That's why it's so important that we start with the blood. I have to understand if I'm ministering to somebody else, and even for my own life, there is power in the blood to defeat those things. But while I don't even know that those, those uh, lassoes that go out, those spirits that come out, we open doorways and give Satan permission and his demons, his enemy. We give him a permission to take areas of our life strongholds Often because we don't even understand that when a wound comes, the way of dealing with it in a healthy way is bring it to the cross, let Jesus heal, forgive, be forgiven, and go through that process with the Holy Spirit. The danger is if I don't do that, I, it lays dormant and it festers, and it's an open door for the enemy to come in through his spirit, through my flesh, anger, Bitterness, resentment, because that's in me, that's my nature, that's in me. If the Holy Spirit isn't controlling that and I'm allowing the blood of Jesus to have defeated it, I, this is the difference between does God do it or do I do it? God has done it. Jesus has done the work, I have to receive it and live in it. So inner healing is a matter of am I going to believe it by faith, receive it and walk in it. The thoughts of my mind will keep me in the bondage. And either the Holy Spirit's going to reveal something that you didn't know, which is a lie, or it's an unknown, and we're in ignorance, and you go, wow, that's why I'm doing that all the time. That's what's been in my heart all this time. Now I know why I've felt like I'm less than. You know, that's what, that's what Joella was talking about. Years, didn't really understand why she was never feeling good enough, feeling this shame every time she went into church, can't open her mouth, because what, if people really know what I'm like? When the truth was revealed to her, which was a very simple truth, that you're believing a lie. 45 years of believing a lie. In one second she was free. It wasn't, it wasn't a hands on her, push her over, fall down. You know, it wasn't that kind of boom, the spirit. It was the revelation of the truth. When the truth comes, it will set you free. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. If you abide in my word... You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's why we need to know the word, to bring the truth to women. But if the Holy Spirit's not involved, if all you give them is the truth, the dry truth, and their spirit isn't accepting it, they won't have the healing. Jesus said, are you willing to be healed? I have to have a willing heart. I have to want to be healed. Let's turn to um, Mark. I'm sorry, Matthew. Matthew 9. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. 
But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest will send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus was going to leave. Right now, he's walking around and he's casting out demons. He's healing the sick. He's bringing the good news of the gospel. He's healing the brokenhearted. But he's going to be going. And he's leaving the workers to do the work. And he said, greater things will you do than I did. And how is he going to do that? He calls his 12 disciples to them, and he gave them power. He gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. He gave them power. God wants to give us power. He's given it. When, you, when we're born again, and we receive his Holy Spirit, his power comes in. But if I don't believe in the power, if I don't even know I have the power, I think Shelley said she was raised in a church talking about the Holy Spirit all the time. No idea there was power. Comfort, guidance, power, power to deliver people, power to be bold, power to call it what it is and name it, and see people set free. You want to minister to others, you have to break the fear. Because Jesus didn't give us the spirit of fear. Fear brings torment. Perfect love casts out fear. So where does the inner healing start? The, it being an inner healing ministry? It starts with intimacy. With the Holy Spirit. John 4. John, 1 John 4.18 Perfect love casts out fear. When I am in a place of fear, I have to tell myself, Okay, Lord, i got to get back to perfect love because I'm not walking in it right now. I was having some of that last night. Hey Lord, your love is perfect. You're not going to let me drown. You're not going to let me fall. Help me. This is a hard, hard session to teach. Because the enemy doesn't want this stuff to go out. He doesn't want you to receive it. He doesn't want me to be able to present it in a way that will help you. It's a hard, You have to pray before you bring healing to people in their hearts. Because when the enemy knows you're healed, he hates what's going to happen, which is this. Because your depression turns to joy. And you start dancing like Joella did. And like many of you have received. And he doesn't want you leaving here and bringing other women to freedom and joy. Where is your joy quota? It's another great question to ask a woman. Ask yourself that. Do I have joy? Do you have the joy bells ringing down in your heart? The joy of the Lord is my strength. So if somebody doesn't have joy, that's a good indication there's some pain going on in there. That they need released from something that is so deeply wounded, it needs healed. And sometimes we can choose to keep carrying things on our backs, like the caterpillar skin or the cocoon skin that Jesus is saying, I took that away years ago. You're still living in the past. You're still living with a victim mentality. You're still living with the pain and the wounding. But I healed that. God is not confined to time and space. He is the healer today and he can heal the memories. What you are today is not who you were in the past and you're not defined by your past. You're the daughter of the king and that's the message that we want to bring to people. Jesus went out and he had compassion on the multitude because he saw that they were weary and they were scattered, running around like lost sheep. And to solve the problem, he gave his disciples power and he's given us power. But we have to believe it. Do I believe that he's given me power to help others? This dancing butterfly reminds me of Sherry's favorite verse, which is in Psalm um, 30. G uh, Geneva, could you make your way up here? Thank you. Psalm 30. Um, how, do we, how do we begin to help people with other inner healing, or how do I help myself? Verse 2. Lord, I cried out to you and you healed me. That's the first step. Cry out to him. Confess that you have a need. Acknowledge that you're in a mess. 
there is something very healing and cleansing about getting on your own and venting to the Lord, <laughs> right? Sometimes you don't need a room of people. My deepest pain and agony has not been called out to anybody, and I can guarantee that there's many of you in this room, that your deepest pain, you cry out alone in your room. It's the tears that you cry in your car, or in your bedroom, or in your closet, where you're trying not to let the neighbors hear through the wall, and you're stuffing things up against it, or stuffing something in your mouth because you're crying so hard. Those are the tears that nobody sees, but God sees them. And I believe when you allow that to happen, when you let that flow come, and as Shelley suggested, you're just pouring it out to him. And say, God, heal me. It's a part, it, it's belief comes into play. It's like, I've got to confess it again. Say, God, I'm hurting. This hurt me. That person hurt me. That person betrayed me. That person offended me. That person rejected me again and again. And some of you are living it on a daily basis. It hurts to walk through this. This isn't easy. But i got to pick up my cross and carry it daily. Die daily. And that's what we have to encourage our room to. I'm sorry we go through. But there is hope in Jesus. Die daily to it. Cry it out to him. He is the comforter. He brings healing. One of the, uh, Ray Eicher, as he told me about what he'd gone through, it was so much was about the forgiveness, forgiving other people. All the time he just had to forgive things that had happened in his past. But as he shared that message, there was a lady, a friend of mine was in that room. She, she left that night and she called me. She said, I need to see that guy. She'd been a believer for many years, a friend of mine, who, lived, who was a believer who lived as a victim. She was always complaining about her husband, always complaining about her circumstances, blamed him for where he moved her to, blamed her. So, I mean, always lovely Christian, but sometimes it was just like, oh my goodness, this poor man, he gets blamed for everything. She's sitting in the room with us and she, she's like, when Ray Anker's talking, she's going, Wow, she's just mesmerized, and I have no idea what's going on, so she called and said, can I come back and see him? And I said, sure. She comes back the next morning, and she sat down and talked, and he pulled out this carrot. And he started talking about the things, the inner wounds of the heart, and he said, is there anything on here that speaks to you? Like, we have all these behaviors above the ground, our, our outward behaviors, which could be anger, or, or just the mask on, or the um, bitterness or self-pity and all of this. And she had the victim, the self-pity thing going on. And he said, let's get to the root. Is it a lack of nurture? Is it rejection? Is it somebody spoke words against you, human expectations, all the thing we had up on, on the board there. And she said, rejection and, and words that have been spoken, words of curse. And he took her back and he said, tell me about your childhood. It went right back to her childhood as a baby when she'd been rejected by her mother in preference for her older sister. Then her grandmother had treated her badly. And then she'd been physically and sexually abused by an uncle in the family. And then she married a man who had physically abused her. And then, I mean, it just went on and on and on. So this lovely man that she's now married to, he was getting a whole lot. Because she had this history of pain. Now, she's come to know Jesus through her husband. Because she was a Jehovah's Witness. And she, I mean, instead of saying, I thank God for bringing this man in my life. Because he brought me to Jesus. She was thankful she'd met Jesus. But she blamed the man for moving from here to here. And if he hadn't moved her from here to here, she never got saved. But her wounding was so deep. She was carrying all that and firing it every day at her husband. And the poor man, he had the grace of God all over him to survive it. But as Ray Hiker walked her through that, she had to not ignore the, the pain or the bad that was done to her. We were able to weep with her over that. We cried with her over it. We didn't say, well, get over it. We wept with her and, said, and he said, I said, I am sorry. He said, God saw that pain. But you know, he wants you to confess unforgiveness and resentment towards your mother, towards your grandmother towards your ex-husband, towards them. She starts confessing it, just as simple. What I saw happening was, it was like watching what Jesus did at the tomb with Lazarus. He told those that were standing near, he said, roll the stone away. And our call is remove the stones. Help women to see what the stone is in front of their life. 
And then you invite Jesus to bring them out from death to life. And then he said, when Lazarus came out of the grave, now take off the bondages, take off the wounds. We come along as disciples like this good Samaritan, pour oil on the wounds. Take off the bandages, take off the blindness from their eyes. Give them the word of God, love on them, pray with them. That's what you are, that's a ministry of healing. It's like just stand by the grave with them. They're in the grave in some level of that death cocoon. And you need to bring them to Jesus, and he's the one that's going to tell you what to do. He's going to tell you when to remove the stone or which stone to remove. He's going to tell you which bondage to take off. And he's then going to say, come forward. And you're not even going to see it because it's the Holy Spirit in them. I have sat with women, some of you in this room, where I've been terrified. I've been like, what am I doing? I'm praying with this woman. I'm listening to her, and I'm asking her questions just as the Holy Spirit tells me. I don't have a script. I'm just listening and saying, okay, tell me about this. Well, what about that? And it's, it can sound to me like a mean judgment or I'm prodding too much. And then I will come. It's like, it's like opening up the grave and the dead bones are coming out. And as they come out, it's like aha light bulbs are going on all over. Wow. And another level of freedom comes. And it may not be the whole freedom because some, if you've gone through lots and lots of layers of pain, there may be a lot of unraveling to do to bring you to freedom. But God wants us wholly freed. And that's why that verse, glory to glory, means so much. Because he's taken us evermore to transform us into his image. Because really what this is all about is he is looking for those who will be conformed to him. It's the death of the old man and it's living in the new. It's that simple. Paul says, be, I pray for you, in Thessalonians 1 Verse 5.23, I pray for that you will be complete in spirit, soul, and body. And he says, if you're not in the Bible, I would say, take them to Isaiah 61, Luke chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. I pray for you to be complete in spirit, soul, and body. Your soul, what's the soul made up of? Mind, emotions, and your will. The healing of the mind and the heart will only happen when you exercise your will because God gave us a free choice. He gave us a will. I can choose if I want to be healed or not. That's where the victim mentality has to be challenged. It doesn't matter how much you've been through. It doesn't matter what pain. There is a way out, but you have to be willing to let go of hanging on to resentment, bitterness, anger, shame, fear, whatever it is and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you by a choice of my will.